Hello everyone, um, it's really great to be invited to talk to a group of people so enthusiastic about plants like myself. Uh, so this talk is on mountain plants and the threats that they face under climate change. And I'm going to take the focus for the kind of core part of the talk from our research and long term monitoring at Ben Laws in the central Scottish Highlands. But then also um, for this talk, kind of broadening it towards the end and looking at uh, trends more widely across Scotland using very recent data from the BSBI plant atlas. And then putting this in, in the context of research needs for Arctic alpine plants uh, in general under threat from climate change. And then finally finishing off with some conservation actions that we might be able to do to help protect on. So, so yeah, in the introduction there, it was mentioned that uh, some of the content from this talk comes from a recent paper called Riding the Elevator to Extinction, which was published just last year in Biological Conservation. So if you're interested in some more of the data analysis and the science uh, behind this, then please go ahead and look at the paper. It's available open access online so and anyone can, can read it. Uh, so a bit more about myself and my background. So I, I'm an ecologist. I did my undergraduate in ecological sciences at the University of Edinburgh, graduating in 2012. So there's some people who taught me in the audience today. So thanks very much. And this is kind of what happened next. Um, <laughs> so after I finished at Edinburgh, um, did my undergraduate there, I finished and was fortunate enough to start my a, a new job as the seasonal ecologist at Ben Laws Nature Reserve, um, working for the National Trust for Scotland. Uh, and that was monitoring the, rare, the populations of rare Arctic alpine plants at the site, which this talk is based on. Um, I was there from 2013 till 2020. Uh, and I left the trust in 2020, but I'm still very much involved at Ben Laws because it's also uh, one of the study sites for my part time PhD on mountain woodland restoration. And then in my other part-time life. I am now conservation manager of Karawa Estate in the central uh, highlands of Loch Arbor. So very much putting into practice the kind of outputs that I'm learning through my PhD research. And I'm also chair of the Mountain Woodland Action Group as well now in Scotland. So uh, yeah, if anyone wants to talk about mountain woodland, that's a separate to topic, but I'm very happy to do so. So uh, it's really important to recognise that the contribution to this talk has come from a wide range of amazing people over decades of hard work, uh, particularly staff at uh, Ben Laws, the National Trust for Scotland staff. So property manager David Marden and then his successor Helen Cole and my colleague Dan Watson, who has trained me in much of my botanical knowledge. And then the Global Change Ecology Group at University of Stirling, who helped with the data analysis and publication of, um, that I've just mentioned. And then uh, a whole succession of NTS seasonal ecologists and volunteers who were absolutely fundamental to collecting these data. So just to take a step back and think about why mountain plants are important in Scotland. So um, as I'm sure you'll be aware, there are lots of exciting hotspots for mountain biodiversity, Ben Laws being one of them. But actually, these sites are important in an international context because they have populations of Arctic alpine plants at the range edge of their global distribution. And they're sort of isolated from the range core, as you can see from the dots uh, in the Scottish Highlands. Some of them may have populations in the Alps, but in general, this is a sort of low latitude margins. And then other for other groups of plants in Scotland, you also get them at the upper limits of the northern distribution in Europe. So it's kind of this mix of, of uh, disjunct populations, either at the, the top or the bottom of their range in Scotland, which is why we have quite an exciting uh, biodiversity from botanical point of view. And, and then these range edge populations actually often have unique ge genetic adaptations or diversity because they've been separated for so long since the Ice Age from, from the rest of the, the global population. Um, so, so they can be, can be very, very interesting uh, to study. And one of the reasons for that is they actually uh, provide very important indication of climate change effects 
because uh, it's ex expected that as the climate warms, we will see, or we are seeing in general, uh, species shifting to higher latitudes and altitudes, um, so to migrate uh, to more suitable climates. But of course, if you've got these islands of a suitable habitat, like in the Scottish Highlands, which are surrounded by inhospitable climate, then there's nowhere for these species to migrate to. So they kind of serve as a sort of early warning or canary in the coal mine of uh, climate change at the rear limits of the species range uh, before something might then affect the core of, of the global distribution. Um, so uh, now, one site that provides a sort of really great example of, of to kind of explore this canary in the coal mine idea in terms of climate change is Ben Law's Natural Nature Reserve in the central Scottish Highlands. And the reason for that is that it is uh, without contention the most exciting place in the whole of Britain for mountain plants. It's got the highest abundance uh, uh, concentration of nationally rare arctic alpine species uh, for the whole country and um the reason for that is that it's got this high altitude so ben laws itself is the is the highest mountain in the range which is the 10th highest mountain in britain but then there are also uh, six other munro summits uh, across the range so ben laws refers not only to, to one mountain but actually to this whole mountain range which uh, encompasses about 6,000 uh, hectares. And um, uh, because it was so important botanically, uh, it was acquired by the National Trust for Scotland in 1950, principally for the purpose of nature conservation. And it's been designated SSSI, NNR, SAC, et cetera, for, for, the, for the botany. And it, as well as the high altitude, it also has the very uh, unusual calcareous geology so Dalradium mica schists, and so it's the combination of the altitude and the geology, which means it's, it's home to such a, a fantastic array of plants. So uh, it's just nice to show some pictures of these plants, uh, some of who will feature uh, more widely throughout the talk. Um, so these, these are nationally rare species, all of them, um, and it, some of them, so for example, the snow powwow only occurs on Ben Laws in the whole of Britain, apart from 13 plants on a neighbouring Munro. So it has its whole distribution at just this one site. Um, and then the other plants, so the alpine gentian, the dripping saxophage, well, in fact, everything on this slide. There are a few other plant, uh, other sites for these plants in Scotland, but Ben Laws has by far the largest population. And then uh, some more plants are in, in the same way, uh, either found only entirely at Ben Laws. So the bristle sedge Carex microglochin is only found at Ben Laws. We're not sure why it's only there, but that's that's the case. And then these other iconic species, particularly the alpine forget-me-not, uh, has a very large population at Ben Laws and then a few other outlying populations elsewhere in the country. So, so these plants are, are all nationally rare. That means they're found in 15 or fewer 10 kilometer squares across the whole of Britain and Ireland. So Ben Laws has a very important history of rare plant monitoring and, and that was initiated in the early 1980s. At the time due to concerns that there were historical over collecting of these rare plants was uh, causing declines in their populations. So at the time, there wasn't really this concern about climate change, but because of the foresight that uh, David Marden had at the time to implement long term monitoring, this is why we've got a fantastic data set that I can talk about today. So uh, David Marden set up this monitoring scheme with help from uh, Sandy Payne, a uh, well-known botanist at the time, um, who's still active today as well. So these were these these people were very pioneering, uh, going out and and mapping the occurrences of these rare plants across the whole mountain range, um, in, in great detail to try and find out all the different sites uh, where these rare plants were situated. And then from those baseline surveys in the 1980s, then this rolling program of monitoring was set up where every six years or so, 
the sites would be revisited and then there would be uh, population counts of all the plants present. Initially, it was done by estimating because the focus was more on mapping the distribution across the mountain range. But once that um, they were confident that they'd done that, then they could focus uh, on actually counting every single individual plant at these sites, which uh, is very, very time consuming. I can attest to that because this was a core part of my job working for the National Trust for Scotland. So we would use these small little flags um, as temporary markers. So when you were doing your searching for the plants, you put, put the flag in next to it and then you carry on. Uh, and then when you think you've found all the individuals across a little site, then you would take a photograph and count them as you took the flags out. So uh, it very much sort of separates the, the search and counting operation and, and sort of high, makes it as accurate as possible count as you can have in these conditions. Um, but some of these mountain plants, particular snow pearlwort, which is photographed here, uh, um, can be very difficult to identify. So they don't always have these wonderful showy flowers that I had a few slides earlier. Most of the time you're doing the entire plant survey using vegetative features. So you'll be lucky if you get a flower at all. So it does require specialist botanical knowledge, which were passed down through the years by uh, property managers and the ecologists at Ben Laws. So this is snow pearlwort. This is one of the largest plants in the circle. It's one of the largest plants that I've seen. It's probably about four or five centimetres across. It's absolutely massive for this species. And you can see my daughter here. She was five at the time pointing to it. Um, so that's very large for the species. Um, so it just kind of goes to show what you're having to often work with uh, in identifying every single individual, not just the flowering plants. And we did these surveys for all the nationally rare species across Ben Laws. So it was a major undertaking. Um, and as well as the identification challenges, there's also the ch challenges of literally just getting to and working in these high altitude mountain sites. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, we've ended up with these whole distributional maps across the range. This is just a snapshot of a couple of the mountains, but you have all these sites that have been surveyed on a rolling cycle um, and all the plants present counted uh, every six years. And uh, it's, yeah, it's an absolutely unique data set that we have from Ben Laws uh, every six years since 1980s and counting every single plant since the 1990s, not just estimates or, or, or sort of quadrats doing small surveys, it was every single plant or as close as we could get to that. So, and for some of this, as I've said, a significant proportion of the British population. And, and this was only possible through the foresight of the National Trust for Scotland and long-term monitoring and staff continuity, enabling these specialist botanical skills to be passed on to the succession of seasonal ecologists, including myself, who had the pleasure of working with these amazing Arctic alpine plants. So I'm going to move on now to some of, to talk about some of the data that we found. So there's going to be a few charts, but uh, I'll explain what's going on because th these are really important for discussing the uh, long-term population trends. So these are um, some of the rare plants that were monitored in most detail at Ben Laws. There are 10, 10 species here. And um, this is this plot shows the, the percentage of the baseline population which was taken in the early 1990s, because that's when we had from that point onwards, we felt we had the most accurate counts of individuals, whereas before it was estimates. So it's a percentage of the baseline population in the early 1990s and change over time. So the dashed line in the middle, 100%, that's basically meaning there's been no change since the 1990s. And the reason for plotting this as a percentage rather than the raw data of counts is because some of these plants populations across the site would have several thousands of plant individuals, but then others, it was more like a few hundred. So if I plotted that together, you, you couldn't really kind of compare trends over time between species. So that's why here it's a percentage. Um, so, and uh, it sort of 
they don't all start at the beginning of the early 1990s or end at 2000, 2020. It's just because where the kind of survey cycle uh, started and ended for each species. But there's about three or four survey points uh, for each of these here. So I'll just go through the story uh, because there are a few kind of different trends. So these four plants here uh, all sort of in the most recent survey, it had increased their population size relative to the 1990s. So you've got Cystopteris montana, which is a uh, mountain bladder fern. They're actually like doubling in population size. This, this is a lovely fern, which likes sort of sheltered overhangs in the high corries. Then the Carex atroposca, the scorched alpine sedge, uh, and Veronica fruticans, that's an interesting one, uh, has increased the rock speedwell, and also the close-headed alpine sedge, uh, the Carex norvegica. So there's, there's two sedges there uh, where the population has actually increased. So, so that's, that's good. So we don't have to worry about uh, any Im imminent threat of uh, extinction to those ones. And then these three plants uh, in the middle, sort of, there's a bit of fluctuation, but more or less uh, stable over time. Uh, so woodsia alpina, alpine woodsia, again, another fern, and then the lovely Erigeron borealis, which looks like a very sort of showy daisy on the ledges, and the uh, alpine forget-me-not, which declined by 32%, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, that's not too dramatic a decline. So those are the ones in the middle, but as you can probably imagine what's coming next, we've got these three plants who have declined uh, significantly uh, since the early 1990s. So the dripping saxifrage uh, has declined by 54%, the um, sabulina, well, that's mountain sandwort, 58%, and uh, snow pearlwort, sagina navalis, which I was mentioning earlier uh, with the identification challenges, that's uh, one of my favorite plants, actually. Uh, so unfortunately, that one has declined by 66%. So that is a huge loss, uh, bearing in mind as well that Sagina navalis has uh, nearly the entire British population at the site. So this is essentially a full British population census that we've done. Um, so to talk just briefly about some of the data analysis in the paper. So we've used... Uh, to sort of model the trends over time, we've used what's called negative binomial mixed effects models um, and uh, to account for the change over time. And, and this is modeled by then for these plots, plotting uh, the predictions for the sort of average site, as it were, across Ben Laws. So these counts were made up of that account, uh, counts at individual subsites across the whole mountain range. So, so these are kind of what the trends would be for the sort of hypothetical average site and what's happened to that. So taking Sagina Navalis in the early 1990s, the average site would have had the 75 plants and, and, and by 2020, it's gone down to about 30. So these models very robustly demonstrated that the three plants at the top had increased over time. And then the three uh, Arctic Alpine plants at the bottom there had uh, declined over time. So that's the trends, but uh, can we sort of find out a bit more about what's going on and what might be causing this? So the, the sort of biggest question would be in, in terms of climate change and distributional shifts is what's happening with altitude? So this plot here is um, the pop. So each dot is the population size of the most recent counts for these plants relative to the 1990s baseline. So again, it's sort of change over time. Erigeron, Bali, are this there in the middle that hasn't changed very much since the 1990s. And then that's plotted against the maximum altitude that each of these species occurs at on Ben Laws itself. And it's very clear to see that there's this cluster there at the bottom right of, of these four species uh, who have declined. And they're also the ones who are found highest up the hill on Ben Laws, so the high altitude species. Um, and our model here shows that about 50% of the variation in population change is related to the maximum altitude, which is actually quite strong in statistical terms. And then this little thing at the bottom that says interaction time 
at time times altitude is actually probably our most important result of the whole study, but it's quite difficult to show it graphically. Um, so that basically means from our modeling that we found out that the species which had declined the most over time had also declined even more rapidly at their lower altitude sites on Ben Laws. So the sites furthest up the mountain maybe hadn't declined as much, but but the ones ones lower down the hill had this interaction between time and altitude. So they were the, the worst hit in terms of population decline. Um, so then to kind of move on from that and look at these three species that have declined the most, and uh, they all actually had their lowest altitude sites on Ben Laws completely uh, extinct or extirpated. So those ones have completely gone. So we've lost the, the minimum altitude sites. So for example, Sagina Navalis, previously at 840 meters, now its lowest altitude in the whole of Britain is at 950 meters, which is Monroe Heights. That's the lowest altitude you'll find it. And then the dripping saxophrage, Saxophraga cernia, Previously at 1,139 was its minimum altitude, and now on Ben Laws, its minimum altitude is 1,161, bearing in mind the actual summit of the mountain is 1,214. So it's literally found in the top 50 meters of, of this mountain. And then what's more important is that the two at the bottom, Sabulina rubella, Sagina novalis, they have their very southernmost limit of their European distribution at Ben Laws, its site uh, it, as well. So yeah, these are the most strongly Arctic alpine species that we have at the site. And then habitat's important here, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the, these are all species of uh, low growing species of very kind of sparsely vegetated habitat. So that might give a clue as to possibly what's driving their mm -hmm. decline. Uh, but yeah, 66% of the entire British population of snow pearl or Sagina novalis uh, is a very catastrophic decline. So to move on um, to the last chart that I present in my paper, um, which again is plotting for each of these 10 species that we studied, their population size in the most recent survey relative to the 1990s baseline, that's indicated by the crosses and the uh, left-hand y-axis. And then the right-hand y-axis is uh, the proportion of sites in the most recent survey um, in the last few years that had experienced these significant habitat pressures. So the way I managed to sort of collect these data was that uh, the NTS staff had fortunately made a really good log of visual changes at the site and, and changes to do with vegetation cover. Um, so I was able to use, um, and also the photographic efforts because every site had a photograph taken of it when it was visited. So we were able to sort of turn qualitative data into quantitative data here uh, and look at portion of sites with these different effects. Um, so you can see here that the species on the right hand side that have declined the most have also got uh, a lot of significant site pressures occurring recently, um, particularly the sites becoming more vegetated. So that's 50 percent of the site was uh, covered by significantly more vegetation than previous surveys. But then there's also other things going on, like dynamic pressures of landslip and rockfall and some localized sheep trampling. But Sagina Navalis here, I mean, nearly 90% of sites had experienced some kind of dramatic pressure, uh, which shows that there, there's definitely a visual change to the habitat that's causing these declines. So habitat type is really, really important here. So I like to compare the species that increase the most to Stoptrus montana with the, the snow pearl wart. Uh, Cystopteris montana it, it's a fern and it, it tends to be found in these shady uh, un, overhang, underneath shady overhangs high up in quarries and so there's a lot of moisture there and uh, it doesn't seem to mind too much kind of these other well relatively speaking in arctic alpine terms tall plants I mean they're all very short but in arctic alpine terms these are quite tall um sort of growing next to it and um, so that contrasts a lot with the snow pearl which is a, a small cushion forming plant only about one or two centimeters across and it 
very much grows. As you can see, these tags indicating where plants are clustered in these kind of areas of bare soil and, and not in the surrounding vegetation. So it, it really requires these sparsely vegetated areas that are free from competition from, from other plants. And uh, you can kind of see the visual changes here, which are represented for the snow pearl sojanin virus habitat, represented really well by uh, an amazing piece of fieldwork that David Marden set up in the 80s and 90s. Um, so he actually put out quadrats and counted all the plants and monitored their life history, uh, followed individuals over time, and then also to, again took photographs so you can see this is the same plot, believe it or not. So I think the, the top picture is, is the early 80s, and then this one is about 20 years later, um, and it's just completely unrecognizable the, <laughs> the depth of vegetation there uh, and there's no plants uh, no sojana navalis plants anyway there um i mean you would expect in arctic alpine habitats uh sojana navalis is a pioneer and you will expect there to be a level of a sort of change and yeah dynamic habitats of maybe places get colonized by vegetation over time but other areas get opened up so it's not unexpected that you do get vegetation encroachment on these areas, but it's just the rapid pace that this has been happening in recent years that uh, may have contributed to the decline of the snow pearl And then there's this some species that are maybe in the middle. Um, so the Myosotis alpestris is a high altitude forget-me-not um, and is found relatively high up Ben Laws, but it, it, it again, it's relatively tall and it, does quite well on these very herbaceous ledges um, amongst other tall herbs. So it's maybe suffered some of the effects of climate change, but hasn't had to deal with so much of the kind of competition issues that we're seeing for the ones that have declined the most. So to kind of summarize these pressures that are acting on, on these Arctic alpine plants. So we found that there was dynamic landslips and rockfalls at some of the sites that might have just completely wiped out most of the colony in one go. And then also localized uh, trampling events by sheep and deer, although that can be balanced by the fact that it does sometimes create new open habitats if there's the right balance of, of herbivores. And then, as I've mentioned, particularly this encroachment of the surrounding vegetation, uh, which comes out, uh, comes in and um, completely swamps out the low growing plants. Um, but we think that this, these pressures are all being severely exacerbated by climate change and uh, particularly changes in snow lie. So snow pearlwort, I think the, the clue is in the name snow pearlwort, um, that there's this implied relationship with snow. And so under climate change, we're seeing shorter winters and then also uh, snow melt much earlier on in, in the year. So there aren't these longer lying snow patches that you would normally have protecting these sites. And the snow is really important for protecting these sites from, from dynamic erosive processes like three, four and rockfall. So if we don't have the snow, that might be why we're seeing some of these colonies suddenly getting wiped out by these extreme events. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the snow also protects the Arctic alpine snowbed habitats from encroachment by surrounding vegetation, because if this, the snow is melting earlier, then that's lengthening the, the growing season, changing vegetation phenology, and then allowing these more competitive lowland species to, to come into the habitat when normally they wouldn't have been able to survive with, with the long lying snow. And uh, this sort of aligns with research that's done more that's been done more broadly across Scotland uh, on a process called biotic homogenization, whereby these specialist uh, Arctic alpine plants are declining and being outcompeted by more vigorous lowland species uh, that move up the hill and, and, and uh, encroach on the the formerly specialist Arctic alpine habitats. So um, we're very much seeing at Ben Laws, uh, what's aligning with these broad trends across Europe and other mountain regions uh, globally, where um, species are shifting uphill um, or to higher latitudes. 
Um, and you're seeing biotic homogenization and also things like mountain greening as the vegetation changes with these lowland uh, forbs and grasses coming in. Um, but at sites like Ben Laws, there's only so much up the hill that they can go. So what we're seeing is rather than an, a range shift, it's actually a range contraction because there isn't anywhere else above the mountain. This, they're already sort of very near the, the, the limit of, of the mountain itself. So uh, this is very much the kind of riding the, riding the escalator to extinction idea, uh, seeing that the loss of the lowest altitude sites and range construction. So it's been talked about very much as a kind of proposed or projected uh, impact of climate change, but we're actually seeing uh, dramatic evidence of this right now uh, in, in the Scottish Highlands with some of our rarest Arctic alpine plants. So very much fun functioning as a canary in the coal mine for broader impacts of climate change on, on mountain plants. So um, I think I've done this talk a sort of a few times over the last couple of years. And, and what's always really nice about it is that every time I always add new content and, and talk about some progression in research. Uh, so it kind of shows that it, it's a very dynamic topic and it's not just static and the research has just sat there and I'm repeating the same talk. So I always like being asked to give a talk and then getting the opportunity to update my slides with the kind of more recent research uh, that's going on. And um, I'm sure lots of you will be aware that the, the BSBI published the Plant Atlas 2000, uh, was just launched last week. A Scotland launch here at the Botanics, um, which is an incredible study looking at data or at the scale of the 10 kilometre square across Britain and Ireland. So it's completely different scale from what we were doing at Ben Laws, which is literally at the individual plant scale, whereas this is 10 kilometre scale, um, and then looking at trends over time. So they've just published the plant atlas where you can go online and find about these trends for every single species of plant and then also look at the published atlas as well and then there's a summary booklet which which summarizes the the main findings of the work and uh, I was yeah quite excited when I got hold of the summary booklet and read not only in the summary but in the summary of the summary of the whole atlas for 70 years of plant recording that uh the, they mentioned that, um, well, I'll just read it. The decline of some montane plants associated with snow patches suggests that some species are also responding to ecological changes brought about by climate change, most notably reduced snow cover and increasing competition. So, yeah, it's it's quite remarkable that this is in the summary of the summary and just shows kind of what an impact this may have for our flora uh, now and then in the years to come. So uh, this chart. Uh, on the right hand side, I have very kindly uh, stole off the Scottish BSBI office's presentation from last week, Matt Harding's presentation. So this is actually a Scotland specific chart. So there are charts like this in the summary booklet of trends of groups over groups of plants over time. But this one was actually picked out specifically for Scotland. Um, and, and, and yeah, there's, there's lots of data like this on, on you know, different woodland species uh, and neophytes and archaeophytes and native plants. Uh, but this is, this is the one that shows montane species in Scotland. And uh, I mean, it's maybe not as dramatic a decline as I've seen for some of the very specialist Arctic alpine plants at Ben Laws. But this is all montane plants. And there's, there's a definite uh, dip there going down in the curve, a definite decline, uh, particularly in more recent years. And that will be due to, due to many pressures. So climate change has been picked up as one of the major ones, but there will also be other pressures acting on montane plants. So particularly changes in grazing or overgrazing, or in some cases undergrazing as well. And then nitrogen depos deposition, pollution and disturbance as well. So this chart will capture all of that, not just climate change, but I think it kind of goes to show what's happening to our montane flora more broadly. So um, it's been great looking at the data on the plant atlas and being able to pull out a few stories for some of the other uh, montane plants found in Scotland. And this is one, the alpine lady fern is one that the BSBI really highlighted in their publicity that was uh, experiencing a very strong decline in Scotland. So 
the grey dots on on the map they're 10 by 10 squares and, and they're all the ones that have uh, there's they were surveyed before and they found the plant and and now in the most recent survey uh, in 2000 to 2019 that, that it wasn't found so it's gone and there's quite a lot squares there that it's not present anymore and then this trend chart here um it's the relative fre frequency that it was found over time uh, more recently and that's been adjusted using modeling for differences in in surveyor effort or over time but this is all explained very well in in the atlas um, so, yeah, I feel a bit bad that I've plonked the picture of Alpine Lady Fern over England, but it's because it's not found in England. Um, so, yeah, that's that's another species. Uh, it's this kind of more acid loving fern, but it's very strongly associated with these sites of, of late lying snow. This this plant actually was on Karawa in our highest quarry with our longest lying snow, uh, north facing quarry. So uh, again, the snow lie story is probably very important for what's going on with this one. And then I uh, picked out four more montane plants found in Scotland that have also experienced these quite strong declines in, in the data from the plant atlas, particularly moss campion, Silenia colis. Um, there's actually has been some work uh, published on this um, that modelled projections for the future for the next hundred years or so for this plant, and uh, yeah, the story did not look good at all. Um, so it's yeah, it's kind of very worrying that well that, that that's coming true now, and uh, that there is quite a strong decline. And and the same for sort of another iconic species like purple saxifrage, Saxifraga oppositifolia, and uh, even the Veronica fruticans there. So that. That was one that I mentioned in our study that had actually increased a bit. So this is a bit like the, the broad national trend is a decline, but at a Ben Laws, it, it wasn't. But that's maybe because this population we were studying at Ben Laws is one of the biggest in the whole country, maybe more robust. It's found at higher altitude. So we maybe wouldn't pick up some of the declines that, that, uh, that are happening at other sort of outlying sites in Scotland that we picked up at Ben Laws. So uh, maybe that's one that will start declining in the future. And a similar story, again, for Mountain Avon's Dryas uh, octopetala. Um, so I think it's important to say that not all montane plants have these lines going down on the plant atlas data. There are some that sort of go up and down or they're very much static. Um, so it's still a bit of a mixed mixed bag and some species may even be increasing due to conservation efforts particularly the montane willows i'm studying for my phd um but these ones we we do think are are declining probably to do with climate change um so then to kind of move back from the large well the, the national scale uh and then focusing on the the sort of close-up plant level scale that we've been doing at Ben Laws. So once you get a plant like snow power or Stradina novalis that is found in only very few places across the country, then you can't pick up decline so much in, in the national data because there's only a few dots. So, so it doesn't look that dramatic that just one dot has gone and there's still three dots there. But then when you actually zoom in on one of those dots, so, so this this map there is, is Ben Laws itself, and these are all of our monitoring sites for this species uh, that were present in the original 1981 survey. And all of the blue ones have gone completely, there's no plants there. And we've visited them several times to check, and there's no plants there, and often absolutely no recognisable habitat left. And then the ones that are clinging on are in green, and a lot of them are nearer the top of the mountains, particularly the biggest colonies are right near the summit of Ben Laws. So that just shows what's happening on the local scale uh, in one of these dots on the plant atlas, uh, which is a loss of a huge number of colonies in a very relatively short space of time. Yeah, that's me just zooming in on it, I meant to. <laughs> <laughs> click so you can see it better but hopefully you can see it fine on this wonderful big screen um and so because of our data showing 66 percent decline in this species um its status uh is being changed in its iucn threat status or conservation threat status in britain is being changed from vulnerable to endangered because of our data and that is apparently the first vascular plant in this country uh, to have this change specifically 
due to the threat of climate change. So, I mean, it's a good news story. Uh, it's good to get this recognition, but of course it's, it's very bad news for the plant. Um, so our data show that there's been um, these disjunct mountain outpost sites of these rare Arctic alpine plants in Scotland are, uh, have severely severe declines in their flora. And uh, that is therefore sort of canary in the coal mine, threatening the loss of other mountain biodiversity elsewhere, uh, and, and maybe the signaling, signaling that these changes will happen then in, in the core of the range in, in, in the years to come. And so this suggests that we urgently need climate change mitigation measures uh, to combat climate change and also conservation action to protect these plants. Um, so I think it's important briefly discuss why that might be important because obviously climate change is impacting everything and some people might say yeah this is a shame but these arctic alpine plants have very small populations anyway why why should why should we be so concerned maybe we should just you know give up and and that's that um, in in the in the context of conservation but for me it's one, one of the reasons, apart from the kind of genetic diversity that we may have at these range edge populations, it's also more about the kind of cultural and inspirational value that rare plants represent. So when I started my undergraduate degree in Edinburgh, I was almost kind of very much going towards animal biology and behavioral ecology. And then when I started uh, volunteering at Ben Laws before I became seasonal ecologist, I just utterly was converted almost overnight into a botanist and uh, that's pretty much due to just these spectacular rare plants being so inspiring and uh, I don't know if I would be doing my job in ecological conservation now if it wasn't for the fact that I was captivated by these plants. So uh, thinking about for my own kids who've been lucky enough to see them for themselves but if you know if generations to come don't have this uh, amazing resource of botany and these high mountain areas to inspire them, then they're, they're losing this opportunity that I had. So uh, to, to get towards the end of the talk, so um, I am writing up a review paper on kind of looking at general research needs for mountain plants in, in the face of climate change. So the, the, these kind of points are, are broadly speaking in, in the global context as well, not just for Scotland or Ben Laws. Um, but I think it, it would be great to see some more research on the understudied plant groups, particularly bryophytes and lichens. There are amazing uh, diversity of snowbed bryophytes in this country. There's been some wonderful snowbed surveys already undertaken, so it would be great to have them repeated uh, because I'm, I'm sure the changes would be astonishing um, in a bad way. <laughs> and then if you're making predictions for the future of how climate change might affect these mountain plants, um, one of the kind of areas of research is, is at the very local scale, so looking at micro topography and microclimate. So if you're doing mo models very broadly, it's going to uh, a population change over time. Very broadly speaking, that might not capture these huge changes that we have in topography and microclimate in, in mountain areas with lots of steep bridges and hollows. Um, and the climate can vary hugely in just the space of a few meters. So this, these pictures at the bottom here, this is Phyllodochi, which is a, a, a dwarf shrub species. Um, it's only found in a few sites in Scotland, not on Ben Laws, I hasten to add. Um, and I went to visit one of its sites last year and it was on this remarkably sunny day in August. But when I got to the site, it's just the way that the topography was, there was uh, the shadow completely, like literally marking out the whole population of this rare plant. And when you get into it, like the temperature drop was phenomenal. I had to put on all my clothes. So that just like sort of brought home to me, okay, there are these dramatic changes in temperature across these landscapes. Could that provide some kind of buffer against climate change, at least in the immediate term, while we get our act together about how we're going to solve it? Um, if there are these refuges, then some species may be able to um, persist a bit longer than we predicted. Um, or these sites may offer valuable places for maybe plant reintroductions in the future. And then other research needs. Um, so I've talked about 
competition and that these vigorous lowland species invading the Arctic alpine habitats. But another biotic interaction that's really important in montane situation is actually facilitation that is other species um, just by the way that they're growing and in the environment uh, influencing positively the growth and reproduction of others which is very important in very extreme environments like we have in montane areas. Um, so if things are moving so rapidly with climate change, then maybe some of these plants, like cushion forming plants are very important pioneers that facilitate then others coming in. But if they're not able to keep up with the change, then maybe the plants that they facilitate may be negatively impacted as well. And then the sort of suite of invertebrate uh, bird life as well that depend on them. And then at the other end of the spectrum, what's happening with non-native invasive species, if they're colonizing upland environments, maybe they can adapt uh, and move uphill even more rapidly in response to climate change, which could be another comp competitive pressure. And then hybridization is a very interesting one. So if lowland plants are moving uphill and potentially coming into contact with upland species, then there could be these kind of new zones of hybridization occurring. and um, is that yeah? Is that a problem for species conservation, um, particularly if the hybrids? Well, if non-native invasive species are moving in and causing hybridization, or could you look at that from the other side and think, well, actually, this is speciation in action, and maybe these hybrids will be more vigorous and able to cope with the new conditions under climate change. So that could be very interesting to see what happens. And uh, scaling from the gene to the scene is a sort of catchphrase I've come up with, just basically thinking about this whole dilemma right from the individual gene and genetic diversity hybridization, and then moving up to kind of land management and uh, landscape scale ecological restoration and how we can actually restore or, or retain robust populations of Arctic alpine plants um, in Scotland, which is very much what I'm working on in my PhD. Uh, so it's about thinking, how can we actually act to conserve these plants uh, on a meaningful way uh, so that they have large enough populations to persist in the future? So that moves me on very nicely to the last couple of slides, which is kind of an epilogue to the story. So then moving back to Ben Laws itself. Uh, so when the paper was in the process of being pu published, I was approached by uh, Dundee Botanic Gardens, who were interested in helping to conserve some of the um, rare Arctic alpines that we were finding that were declining at Ben Laws. So there's a lot of exceptional work going on here at, at the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, but there were a few species that weren't yet covered by the work here. So we kind of thought if there was a combined effort between two botanic gardens to create ex situ conservation collections, because that's really the next step for some of these populations that are so small and they're at the brink the edge of their limits, um, if we can collect seed uh, and grow them on in botanic gardens, then at least we'll have those genetic adaptations preserved that maybe we can help use in other conservation projects, if not in Scotland, then uh, elsewhere higher up in their range. So um, it was very exciting that we went out with the NTS and um, Dundee, people from Dundee to collect seed from the, the three species that had declined the most in our study um, to grow on. And uh, they, uh, I think that the seed from the snow perwort and the mountain sandwort is probably just been germinated. So I'm quite excited to get an update from that. But the drooping saxophage, Saxophage cernua, reproduces vegetatively by bulbils rather than seeds. So they're all essentially a clone of each other. So that's a quite an unusual lack of genetic diversity story. So they basically germinated straight away and, and are growing. And um, so hopefully this is the start of something that we can do to conserve these populations at Ben Laws. And then also offer a research opportunity as well, because you could potentially do controlled growth experiments or work with the plants in the ex situ conservation without having to then go up the mountain to study them or conduct experiments that might potentially damage the fragile populations and their habitats. So hopefully there'll be an update on, on this ex situ conservation work uh, in the future. So that's the end of the talk um, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. <laughs>
you were first. I'm curious in your first slides and you were showing population change at the between the years like 2000 and in the early 2000s, even the species that went up initially did suffer a decline and maybe there were some changes within that same region. And I was wondering if any insight to see what caused those changes initially that were in that first. Yeah, I mean, the populations always fluctuate over time, <laughs> um, which was found in the sort of quadrat study of the snow poet that David did. I mean, sometimes it's just quite dramatic. Um, and so, yeah, there will always be a bit of going up and down, but the long term trend was definitely a decline. And I mean, other factors like survey effort um, or weather conditions as well often affect counts because it's such hard work if you've got an awful day of weather, um, it's going to make your count lower, even if you've got the best motivation in the world. So we tried to mitigate that by not going out in terrible weather and also kind of robust training. Um, but yeah, I think it's just the, some of these plants, particularly snow pearl wort, Sajana novalis, is very short lived. So plants will often only live a couple of years. So that means that the, the fl population fluctuations, I guess, will be more closer together than if it was a very long lived species. <laughs> Did that answer the question? Yeah, I don't think that there was a catastrophic change in the environment at Ben Laws. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I can bring the chart up if you if you want to have a look at it after this, <laughs> afterwards. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think that there was anything specifically that we noticed in the intervening surveys in terms of the habitat pressures. So it would be really useful to maybe look back at, say, weather data and modelling of, of snow cover change in, in those times to kind of see if, if maybe one of those years was a, a sort of very lean or strong winter um, that might sort of explain some of these uh, yeah, changes that uh, in a relatively short space of time. is driven by climate change. So when you're looking at climate data, do you have significant trends in temperature, rainfall, snow cover? Yeah. Yes. yes, repeat that. Uh, Sim was asking if they had a significant changes in temperature and rainfall throughout this period that reflected the plant changes. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that because yeah, so um, there was there's been some papers published. So there was uh, someone called Manda Trevedi who did a PhD, I think, using weather data from a Met Office station very close to Ben Laws and observations of snow cover as well that showed these long term declines. I think since the uh, 1980s until more recently, dramatic changes in snow cover. In, in the central Scottish Highlands where there's Ben Laws. And then he also actually projected into the future. And I think that there would be basically no snow cover at all by the 1980s. So even though we didn't model that ourselves, it's very nice that there was also this paper that showed that. Um, but now at Ben Laws, they have put up a, a automatic weather station at 700 meters that's collecting all these data on site. And then data loggers, buried in the soil to measure snow temperature. So hopefully uh, we'll get more kind of micro climate measurements from these sites in, in the years to come. <laughs> yes. And their commitment by different countries to reduce nitrogen pollution and in upland sites, plants receive a lot of nitrogen pollution through the rain and snow. So um, do you think you're seeing the signal from the nitrogen pollution in conjunction with the climate? Because um, in which case it's just... Yeah, I mean, it could definitely be in there. And I know, again, there's been a lot of great research in Scotland looking at impacts of nitrogen deposition on community composition. But I think that sort of slowed in more recent years, um, so the fact that we're still seeing this accelerated decline, um, I mean, there's no doubt, and I, and I do mention it in the paper, that nitrogen deposition is a really important driver of change. Um, and because we didn't measure that all the snow, it's, it's not easy to kind of pull out which one is having the change. But I think it's the fact that nit nitrogen deposition was a 
problem m m more earlier in in this in this story than than climate change, which has now kind of overtaken and, and caused these more recent changes in the curve. Yeah, I know, and you, it's something that people don't often think about because they think these mountain summits are kind of pristine and free from pollution, and it's completely not the case with nitrogen and then also sulfur as well. Well, I mean, the main thing that I did in that respect was just looking at the altitudinal trends. I think we did try to look at aspect, um, slope aspect as well, but that was almost compounded by microtopography and that there was this one site near the top of Ben Laws that's got really big population and wasn't declining, but it's southeast facing, which is kind of where you would expect there to be a decline, but it's just the fact that there's this big overhang above it and there's really this shadow and it's there till three in the, in the afternoon every day when you're surveying it. It's very, very cold. So that meant those kind of, yeah, the aspect, slope aspect didn't really show a trend. Um, so I think, yeah, it would be, that's like why I sort of thought it'd be really important to mention the microtopography of the kind of research need and looking at that more closely because this remarkable NTS data that they have was very much just focused on counting the plants because it's, that was time consuming as enough, as much as I'd like them to have done measurements on associated flora and microclimate and life history and everything. It was just the time involved in, in getting this data. It was just incredible. So, but now maybe we, that we've shown this population's decline, we can kind of move on to now the more focused sort of scientific research. Yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, you were mentioning at the end, like uh, duplication, and it's interesting with the late for quite a long time in this refuge. Yeah. So I was wondering, is there any studies about genetic diversity, like to, to um, what you said, to estimate the adaptability of climate change? Uh, can I just repeat that? There was a question about uh, hybridization and the genetic diversity of the plants. Uh, have, there, have there been any studies? Yeah, so specifically in Ben Laws, uh, not for any plant, I don't think, that I mentioned apart from the dripping saxophage, saxophage senua, which is the old one that has these clones. <laughs> so they're all the same clone, um, and that's why they don't produce seed. But then I think this, this is quite early research in terms of genetics, but they then crossed seed with Norwegian pollinated with Norwegian plants and they were able to get vi viable seed that way. Um, but it very rarely flowers, um, which is why I'm really excited that I got that photo because that's very rare. But no, nothing genetically done for some of these Arctic alpines. I mean, other, other Arctic alpine plants at Ben Laws, such as montane willows, there has been some genetic work done on that. Um, but uh, I think it would be very interesting to find out actually how diverse is the Dinonophilus across Ben Laws? Are all these sites very, very similar? Or if we're going to collect material for these conservation collections, if we manage to get from all the whole range of sites that are still left, uh, will we get a fair amount of diversity? So that's going to be really, really important um, for the future. <laughs> Jane, since the 1980s. I know there have been issues with levels of sheep grazing in certain towers on Ben Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's more or less been the same. So the NTS has got this unusual situation that they own the land, but they don't own the grazing rights, which are heritable associated with farms at the bottom of the hill. So for some of the restoration work that I'm looking at in my PhD, that's an area that they've been able to fence off because they have the grazing rights. But over much of the, in fact, all of the sites, I think, where all of these plants I've been talking about in the talk, they're on the open hill where they're still grazing. And I think that's been more or less the same over the course of this study. Has been a bit of change in just the very most recent years, lower altitude, but not, I think that's after 2020 when this these data were collected. Um, so, but grazing is an interesting one because for some Plants like the montane willows are very susceptible to grazing. So uh, we're worried about too much grazing. But then at the other end of the spectrum, particularly for things like alpine gentian, and maybe even the snow pole wart, like the grazing, it's important to find the balance because the, the not so much the actual action of grazers eating plants, but more the disturbance of just uh, animals moving about over the ground can create some of these 
bare ground niches that the plants are found. And the biggest site for snow pearl is actually in a <laughs> quite a heavily sheep grazed area. So if people were to tell me to remove the grazing from that site, I'd actually be quite worried about it. it it's just the balance is just whether there's too little snow light and then too much action by the grazers, then they might start to, it st might start to tip the other way and then grazing does become a problem. Um, but it's, yeah, it's complicated. And for some of these very small plants, it's definitely not a case of removing it completely. Yeah, my, my question was to say. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Yes. I know questions on your research, which is very fascinating. But I was wondering, I mentioned when you worked as a seasonal ecologist, you were converted on one summer night to um, botany. So, yeah, I was just wondering about your experience working for National Trust and maybe one of the experiences that you've had. Is this project or? Yeah, that's a great question because I think it's important to say to people who are interested in yeah, getting into ecology and botany that I didn't particularly have an amazing backstory. Like, so when I actually did my undergraduate at Edinburgh, I didn't really know anything about plant identification. We would know what a daisy was. <laughs> I tried to lie that that was literally it. So in, in my first year, we had a course with identifying plants with field guides, and that was literally the first time I discovered plants that was all this diversity they had all these different names and there was more than one species of grass <laughs> and so that was that was quite eye-opening and, and then yeah um I mean it's just a, of a sort of sheer fact of geography and where I was based over the summer months meant that I could volunteer part-time at Ben Law as well also working a summer job and uh it was a great experience because yeah, they were just quite happy for me to go out with the seasonal ecologists at the time and accompany them and and so that was for me, a very good way of learning because it was basically people just pointing at plants and telling me what they were and writing it down. And, and, and so rather than doing it through keys, although once you've got a bit of that under your belt, then it becomes a lot easier to use plant keys because you can kind of maybe get to family or genus very quickly from what things look like that's similar to what you know. Um, so, yeah, so I volunteered for the NTS for three summers and during my degree and then my predecessor left just when I graduated. So I could just kind of move straight into the seasonal job, which was which was a fantastic opportunity. Um, so, yes, yeah, so very much just getting out there and having a look at lots of exciting plants and accompanying other botanists. I mean, botanists are fantastic. They're always really welcoming. My experience is people love having like beginners along and uh, just sharing knowledge and and experience. So so yeah, it's been really positive for me and just uh, what uh, thirteen years from being like completely having no idea what any plants were to sort of working with some of the most rarest and difficult identified species in Scotland. So yeah, it just goes to show you can start at any point and uh, who knows where you'll end up. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Um, on that very question, there are grants that we give from the Botanical Society of Scotland for research projects. And we've now opened it up to PhD students as well, or postgraduate students. Um, but it must not be related to your thesis. And you have to get permission from your supervisor to get one of these training grants. And for undergraduates, if there's any here, we have a thesis prize every year, but it must be submitted by the this, this school or the department that you were, that you studied in. So, but remind your supervisors that they can submit them on your behalf if they think they're the best thesis. So remember those opportunities for um, younger botanists. And thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk and thank you for your participation. <laughs>